Mr. Mazeo, how are you? Top of the morning Hello. to you. <laughs> Hello, uh, Mike. How are you? I'm fine. Thank you very much. Uh, is, is that I a live is that I live actually on the Wirral, not not in London, on the Wirral, which is near Liverpool. Oh, okay. So you're a, li a Liverpoolian. Well, actually, I'm Cornish, but um, I travel <laughs> around a lot. <laughs> so when, when you say you're Cornish to most Americans, you know, they're going to say, um, are you related to the hens? <laughs> no, I'm I'm um, my mother is actually Cornish. She's a Celt like the Welch. They're not really English, although we call ourselves English. We speak English, not Cornish, but there is a language <laughs> down there. It's very complicated. It's all it's all in our history. <laughs> and it's a long uh, it's a long history. We could do an entire show on that history. Maybe you made a movie about it. Well, I, I did a, um, a documentary, a docudrama for um, EWTN called Wales, the Golden Thread of Faith, which I managed to weave Cornwall in being a a native Cornish person, so I managed to put Cornwall in it as well. They're basically the same peoples. Yeah. So, uh, so this new film that you've uh, you, you've got coming up, do you describe this, the Reformation, as a docu, as a, a as a mini series, uh, or is it just like a regular TV series, or that has a limited run? How would you describe it? Well, it's eleven episodes. It is really a mini mini series, a wow. docudrama. drama. Um, so it's 11 episodes of 30 minutes. We're in the middle of post-production at the moment. We were trying to get it done this year, but uh, post-production always seems to take a lot longer than we intend. And um, it looks like it's going to be, it's penciled in for next March to be filmed, uh, to be um, broadcast on EWTN. Now, so, um, now uh, 11 episodes, 30 minutes each. Does that mean there's uh, there's eleven different parts, or that, uh, that you know you're bouncing between the Reformation in Germany and then in Italy and then in England, or is this like a running timeline where you start uh, at the turn of the 16th century and then go forward to whatever date? Um, well, really, we the first episode is going to be on how the Catholic Church created Western civilization, and we finish with uh, with how. Uh, Luther did not reform the church. Basically, <laughs> that's what we. Uh, True that. That's what, that's what we end up doing. He didn't reform the church. He created something completely new, and um, we we go into how the uh, the Catholic Church uh, uh, proclaimed Christianity. It formed the Bible. It collected the books of the Bible, and through the councils, it de it uh, developed the dogmas which um, all Christians. Um, will follow even Protestant ones. So we actually explain how Christianity uh, reached the Western world and how it formed the Western world, Western society, and all the great glories of it are all based on the Catholic Church and Christendom. So we actually finish with Luther showing how he did not reform the church, but through his psychological problems and his strange theology, created something completely new. And then we go on into the second episode, which is called Luther struggles, struggles with himself and struggles with uh, the church. And we have docudrama sequences. We dramatize, for instance, the Leipzig disputation where Johannes Eck forced Luther to the wall and got him to admit that he is not being faithful to Catholic teaching. He is creating something completely new. But Luther being uh, such an arrogant person with psychological problems actually went off the rails at that point and then he never came back. No matter how hard cardinals and bishops tried to get Luther to come back, he was too arrogant, really, to actually come back. And we we dramatize all these sequences, and we also have professors on. Professor Thomas Madden from um, St. Louis University in America is there. We have Father Mitch Packwell. We have David Anders uh, from EWTN on. And um, we have people like Thomas Crean, who is our theological advisor, Father Thomas Crean, uh, he's on it as well. So um, we get all these great people who have great knowledge. Uh, I mean, I'm a filmmaker. I'm I am I'm not a professor. So I need I need all these people. I need to ask the right right questions, just like you do when you're interviewing people. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you you do your your homework, and then you as, ask the right questions, and you form the program around that, along with. Uh, drama sequences, so it's uh, it's quite a big production. In, in it is the biggest production we've done, 
Um, well, that's not how I do it, uh, Stephanie. It's actually, I just make it up as I go along. So, <laughs> well, I have a couple know, of bullet perhaps, points that I operate. Uh, I don't know. I think you're very good. So perhaps you don't need to do as much preparation as no. I do. You know. <laughs> well, you know what they say, Stephanie, in this business. Uh, if anyone can sense that you did uh, the that you are produced or that you did uh, that you did kind of preparation like that, um, uh, that's not a good thing. So you don't want anyone, you always wanted to, to make yeah. it sound like, wow, how do you do that? Well, I don't know. I just got to make it up. Right. Uh, no, that I, there's, I understand, yeah. You, 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 <laughs> you know as well as I that there's always, uh, if you're going to do a three-hour radio show every day and you're on the hook for all three hours, you better have about six hours worth of things to say. Because, you know, my producer's right. always saying, like, you're never going to get to everything in that pile. I said, I bet I'll re refer to everything in that stack of paper there. That we make. Stefano Mazzeo is on the uh, Dude Maker uh, Skype line with me here. He's got a new film coming out next March, it looks like. Uh, a new series of films, 30 minutes each, 11 episodes in all on EWTN called The Reformation, which uh, sounds fascinating. But uh, look, I could talk to you about your movie, your, your filmography all day long. Tell me about the making of The Crusades. Yeah, The Crusades was our second project. Um which we did. It was it was quite successful. It actually came out when ISIS were up to all their nonsense in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. So it actually came out at the right time. Um, in it, we we dispel all the myths of the Crusades. We say that uh, three quarters of Europe had been overrun. Three quarters of Christendom had been overrun by the Muslims. It was about time in um, in 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 1095 that Christendom made actually made a stand, and Pope Pam. Pope Urban II then called the crusade really to save what was left of Christendom. So we were actually fighting a defensive action during the first crusade. Right. But through lots of miracles, through sheer determination and five years of hard effort, they won Jerusalem back. And then we go on to talk about all the subsequent crusades um, and how, you know, uh, the Templars, forming of the Templars, a uh, wonderful organization, the hospitalers, and we, we dramatize all these and we talk about it. And I had some great experts involved in that one as well. Again, Father um, Thomas Madden and Father Crean was, was, was on it as well. So I've got some great backup people who help me, who know a lot more about it than me. As I say, I'm, I'm a director producer. I'm, I'm not a professor, but um, I, I can tell because when I, when I see things done by the BBC on the Crusades, I think, now I don't think that's right, you know. Well, it's probably not right. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> from my my research and even the professors I get on, they say, we've been on the BBC and they've they've actually edited us to make to make us sound as if we're saying something completely different to right. what we're actually saying, you know. So don't trust the BBC. I know I know you in America think the BBC is really, really no, you know, no, 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 great no. and all that, but it, it's not. <laughs> well, we don't trust any media anymore. So no, no, uh, don't don't trust the modern secular media because they're all into social engineering. Well, you know, they want to change the way people think. Let, 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 <laughs> let, let me uh, stay on the subject of the Crusades for just a moment, mm -hmm. um, dude. Because I haven't seen your work, so I don't know. Do you have a part in here for St. Bernard of Clairvaux? Um, yes, St. Bernard was actually dramatized. We had a, okay. we had a guy, um, you know, tearing, he was tearing bits of his habit and forming crucifix crosses and putting them on the crusaders, you know, and all that sort of thing. So um, there wasn't any spoken drama in this documentary. Ah, okay. uh, it was just purely visuals with narrations and experts talking. But um Throughout it, we did have drama scenes. We, we we staged crusader battles and everything, so it was good fun. Now, I wonder, uh, uh, Stefano Mazzeo, uh, director, producer, and screenwriter, uh, principally for EWTN, but uh, I wonder that this style of filmmaking um, is relatively new. This style of filmmaking that uh, probably uh, had its genesis sometime around the launch uh, maybe the uh, the History Channel on cable or whatever, where you have live enacted scenes of a battle or of conversations going on or debates in a in a in a in a, in a great hall of deliberation like the Parliament or in uh, in Colonial Virginia at the uh, House of Burgesses or whatever, and the actors are actually acting out lines and they're probably actually saying dialogue. It's pretty cool. Um, but all that dialogue is either se severely muted or taken out. 
in favor of some music being thrown in and then a narrator like me piping in over it. Um, and I think that that's a, uh, the, 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 that's a, that's a, a, a very clever way to do the documentary style and to make it just a, a, a bit less documentary. But yeah. I always wonder when I watch it, whose idea was that? How'd they cook that idea up? Um, well, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm just using um, the techniques of the secular media and uh, for the Catholic Church. Yes. So I'm, I'm turning the media on in on itself, you know. Um, uh, for the Reformation and for the message of Fatima, we actually had a lot of dialogue as well as narration, not at the same time, of course, but certainly in the um, in the Reformation, we let Luther talk. You know, I when I'm directing, this actor actually looks very much like Luther. He well, does. I, I he saw does. the trailer. And uh, <laughs> he's a Catholic, actually. <laughs> well, so is Luther to start with. Well, I was going to say, um, Father Luther yeah. was an Augustinian. So, I mean, That's he started right. as a Catholic. Yeah. Yeah, he did. So I let Luther speak. And I remember um, someone asked me, um, what do you feel when you're directing Queen Elizabeth or Henry VIII or Luther? <laughs> I think, ah, I've got you where I want you, you know. <laughs> that's, that's what I kind of like uh, think when I've got Luther in front of me. I said, right, I'm now, the director. You will do, <laughs> you, you will you do will, what I You're going to act this out the way I say, Father Luther. Hey, yeah. uh, uh, Maggie, <laughs> there's a trailer for the Reformation on YouTube. I saw it earlier today. Uh, I think it's trailer number three. Is that right? You saw that one, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. That's, that's it, yeah. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of questions about the trailer that I saw today. And we're, we're speaking with Stefano Mazzeo, who is the uh, director, screenwriter, and producer of this new series coming up called The Reformation. But he's got a lot, of, a lot else in the filmography that we're just kind of catching up and meeting a, a new guest that was introduced to us by the one and only K.V. Turley. Um, uh, in the trailer, the, uh, that was Elizabeth that I saw with the pasty face and the, and the short cropped red hair, correct? Yeah, that was Queen Elizabeth. Okay. Another Who's the actress. She, she was very good. She no, was, no. She, she Now, when I saw her, I go like, Elizabeth. Old. That's Elizabeth. So who is yeah, she? she who like is she? Elizabeth, doesn't she? <laughs> yeah, yeah, she does. Who is she? Monica Nash. She is a, she's a professional actress. She's very good. Uh, she's a Catholic. Um, and um, I hope to... Um, get her in our future productions if I can. You know, very good, very good actress. And she sounds just like you'd imagine uh, Elizabeth I to sound like. She is really good. Well, because um, uh, you being English or, or Cornish, rather. Uh, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Are you you're, you said you're Welsh. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, um, well, Cornish, but English. English. Uh, okay. my, my passport says I'm British, so okay. I, it's, it's, a, it's complicated. It's yeah, pretty I know, I know. I've been there a couple of times, <laughs> I'm aware. Um, <clears throat> when uh, most people's impression of Queen Elizabeth, Bloody Bess, well, most people's impression of her is from the, uh, it's either HBO or Showtime miniseries, Elizabeth. And that's uh, Kate Blanchett. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I've. Um, and she's I've, a very, very diabolically convincing Elizabeth, shrewd and diabolical, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I say she's she's that, uh, but be very careful because after that program came out, everyone was saying how Queen Elizabeth saved Christendom. I thought, what? Oh, bo she, bo she, bollocks! What as you English say. say. <laughs> how they? That's what people are saying over here. How Queen Elizabeth saved Christendom? Of course, nothing of the sort. She helped ruin it. You know. <laughs> uh, now, uh, uh, Stefano, we're, we're going to bounce around here a little bit. So, are mm -hmm. you in production, or have you are, or you're going to be in production to make a film about Mary Queen of Scots? Um, we filmed okay. a lot of it. Um, how that came about was I had all these great actors, and I knew I was going to have all these great actors on site. We had a wonderful manor in Wales, and all we needed was a segment for the Reformation. Uh, a six-minute uh, sequence okay. showing Elizabeth, showing Mary, Queen of Scots, and showing the intrigue about them. But I had all these, so I quickly wrote, actually, I quickly wrote a much longer script and uh, gave it to the actors with, with a week or so to go and said, can we do this? We might be able to get another film out of it. Um, what we've got so far is about 45 minutes of pure drama, and it's really, really good. The costumes, 
by someone called Ellen Plumridge. Uh, she's my um, 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 associate producer. Uh, she got the, all, all this together for me and um, we filmed it. Everyone knew the lines. It was very quick. Uh, I would have liked to have done much more covering shots, would have liked to have taken a lot more care. But what we've got is really, really good fun. And I think it's going to make a great film in its own right. We still need to do some filming on that. So it's still really in production. Um, it's um, it's finding the uh, funds for that, unfortunately, that one. Okay, we're, so, we're hoping to complete it next year. So you'll need B-roll stuff here. Yeah, B-roll and also some more... Um, S some more bridge shots and covering shots. Well, you, and, you know, uh, there, there, there's yeah. a, uh, a a revival of sorts of interest in Mary. Uh, there was a film that came out last year. I, I I didn't see it. I was told it wasn't that good. But there was a film yeah. they uh, you know a Hollywood send up of, but, of Mary Queen of Scots. Did you see that by any chance? I I saw the um, I think it must have been the British one. Okay. Um, it, was it was okay? It oh. wasn't. It wasn't as good as it should have been okay, for the so, money they spent. That's what I. That's uh, what uh, I. Could. So most of these films, though, they ultimately wind up descending into this fantasy, and this totally inaccurate portrayal of Bloody Mary, um, uh, and uh, of, of 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 just uh, dwelling upon the all of the best, yeah, yeah <laughs> of of all the uh, the bad decisions that that, that Queen Mary made. Instead of the decisions that she made, where she was trying to restore the church to the, to to England, and there were many right. many people, and if you read a fair biography of Mary, there were many many people that were very grateful to her, um, you know. And as far as her, her you know, look at all these people that she executed, this and that and the other. Well, she was carrying out the supremacy laws that had been passed by her father. All she did was restore them, not the supremacy laws, the uh, uh, the laws uh, uh, against heresy that Henry had passed. All she did was say, well, can we put these laws back into use? And he said, yes. So do you cover that in your film? Um, uh, yes, we will talk about, um, that's Mary Tudor, Mary I of England. That's not Mary Queen of Scots, of course. Okay, right. um, that's, that's Mary Tudor. Um, yes, we, we will cover uh, Queen Mary. And uh, the mechanism was already in place, as you say, um, for the executions and the form of executions. It wasn't really her. She didn't instigate that. And, and in fact, the last person who was executed by uh, burning in England was about 200 years ago. And that was well after the Reformation had taken place. And sure. that, that person was executed for coining that that's forgery so you could be executed for all sorts of strange things um you know in a, in quite horrible ways and in fact as we showed in our inquisition series most of the burnings actually did not take place during the spanish inquisition they were never done by the church the church uh tried to put the inquisition between the fires and the secular authority to save as many people as possible uh that was an inqui what what the inquisition was it was an inquiry um, the the Protestant world burnt a lot more people. Um, the fires actually took place in the Protestant world, not in the Catholic. And because of the black legend, as the Spanish call it, the black legend, which being that Spain was to blame for all these Inquisition burnings, it never really happened that way. I think about 12,000 in about 600 years, whereas in the Protestant world there was 50,000 burnt um, in about uh, a couple of hundred years. So you can see that the fa fanaticism, especially the witch hunts and the, the witch burnings actually took place in Protestant northern countries, well, not, in the, not in the Catholic world at all. So uh, uh, one thing that the BBC did get right, is they did make in 1992 or 1993, they made a, a, uh, they made a film on the Reformation. I mean, I, I mean, on the Inquisition. Inquisition, yeah. And they said, "You're right. You you know your history, don't you?" Yes, uh, yes. That they did do that, and they did a good job there. I must admit, that was the one, um, one series they did get right. That was before they really developed a their modern hatred of of all things religious, especially Catholic. <laughs> it was before they really got going. 
um, in the in about 1990. So, so, the, so, so, so since you're in English, you could give uh, Americans an insight on this. Stefano Mazzeo is the uh, screenwriter, di director, and producer of a new series of films coming up on EWTN in March called The Reformation. You've got many other films that he's made for EWTN that we're talking about here. Uh, the BBC is... Is kind. Of, it's not like we imagine NBC here or CBS or ABC, because the BBC uh, has many different divisions. It has BBC News, it has BBC Drama, it has BBC uh, Radio, BBC Four. Right is the big is a big one of the big radio channels. So it's a yes. very diverse. I mean, it covers. If, if you're in the UK, the BBC is pretty much everywhere you could possibly be. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. And it's funded through a form of tax called the license fee. Uh, I don't actually possess a television. Uh, believe it or not, I'm a TV producer director, but don't that I don't preserve, produce possess a television. Um, <laughs> and that's because I'd have to pay the BBC a license and the BBC are linked to Planned Parenthood uh, on their website. Um, so they they export all this death to the world through their Call, their website called SexWise, uh, ex especially in Africa, and um, they're linked to a program with Planned Parenthood. So be careful about the BBC. I um, I think they're not a channel that Catholics should try and support. No. I won't pay a license fee, so I can't watch television. Because even if I don't watch the BBC, I still have to pay a license fee as long as I watch um, same-time broadcast programs, like even online. If I were to watch live live web i'd still have to pay a license fee to okay, the bbc so let me ask you a question one of the trailers for the reformation uh yeah. the uh, the poster frame as youtube calls it uh, shows a a bunch of guys ready for battle uh there's crucifix in the background they have a couple of standards there are you dramatizing the pilgrimage of the graces there um that is actually the western rising that's when the cornish oh from, Nor from norfolk right but from from Cornwall. Oh, from Cornwall. That's, I'm that's, sorry. That's the Western Rising because the Cornish, you see, the Cornish at the time spoke Cornish. And when the prayer book came in by um, Edward VI, everyone had to worship in English. Of course, the Cornish couldn't speak English. They could only understand the Latin mass. So all of a sudden, the Latin mass was taken from them and the English service, Church of England service, was forced on them. So they couldn't understand the mass. They were so angry about it, they took up arms and marched on Exeter. They were joined by a load of English Catholics from Devon, and they were actually defeated in the end, but they put up a brave fight to save the, the Latin mass in Cornwall. And that's called the Western Rising or the Prayer Book Rebellion of 1549, and we dramatize that. Well, I can't wait to uh, see this. That's the Five Wounds banner. Uh, which you see behind you there, yep, and there's I a crucifix it. being held by a priest. Um, so it was great fun. I would have, I would have liked a bit few more extras. We had to do the best we could with what we could afford, but we had about sixty on the field that day, and we, you know, tried to film in a way that made it look as if there were a lot more. You, di you didn't call me. I would have come. No, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, you could have been a commander by the sounds of it. <laughs> I, uh, uh, charge, men! <laughs> How would you say charge in Cornish? Uh, I don't know. I can't speak. Oh, Cornish. you can't speak. Okay, all right. <laughs> I would like to, uh, but um, um, there you are. The Cornish language is almost dead. But you're. It died because of this rebellion, really, because um, you know the the church services were all in English, and the after they after the defeat of the Cornish in 1549, there was a kind of uh, genocide taken out against all Catholics uh, and. Um, unless they agreed to speak English and um, agreed to worship the, at, at the Church of England, not the Catholic churches, uh, they were summarily executed. So there was a kind of a, people don't know British history. The only Brit history they know about Britain is the sort that the victors will tell you. And uh, Oh, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we I do the pilgrimage of grace as well. well we've got, uh, we've, Okay. Some clips of that. So I put a book back into print from Father uh, Ger Gerard Culkin called The English Reformation. And uh, mm -hmm. it was last printed in 1961. Uh, I was out of print. I found it, read the book, went, everyone uh, that wants to know about the English Reformation should read Father Culkin's book. Because before he was a priest, 
he got his degree in history. He's a historian from Oxford. So uh, Father Culkin knew, uh, knew, knew his stuff. And that's how I know about the pilgrimage of the graces and what a treacherous liar Henry was to, uh, to, 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 uh, to basically trick the, the leaders of the pilgrimage of the graces to lay their arms down. Yeah, ask, yeah. Right, right. Mm-hmm. To go, oh, no, I just want to talk to you. you know, we, we want to welcome you back in. Of course, Henry winds up executing all of the leaders. Uh, so that they're, their wives, yeah. Right. So do you cover that in, in that episode? Yeah. Yeah, we do. We we um, we show how tricky Henry was, how he sent uh, the Duke of uh, Norfolk up to say to negotiate, say the king is listening to you, uh, put down your arms, uh, go home, and the king will listen to you and put your problems before Parliament. That's what that's what he said. Actually, uh, what he said was, now they've put down their arms, take the leaders and kill them. Right. Oh, of course. <laughs> Try yeah. them and find them guilty. That's that 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 was the. Orders, I think. <laughs> I mean, there uh, there is so much that you could say about uh, about Henry. I, I had a conversation with someone the other day uh, about I, I can't remember how it came up, but I said, you know, uh, but it, it would have been only a couple of machinations away for us to be saying today, Saint Catherine of Aragorn. She was a descendant of Isabella. Um, yeah. She was a very pious and very holy woman, and if you read the actual transcript of what we know, what was said during the uh, the the basically she was put on trial, and Henry uh, accused her of infidelity and adultery and what have you. Yeah. Um, her statement to him was before, her, and she said this, but before before you, my king, and before God, mm. I have never been unfaithful. I would never, yes. I would never violate my vows that I made before you and before God. Very powerful, very, very, very powerful, pious woman was Catherine was of Aragorn. Devout. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah. she was. Mm. Yes, we um, we actually do uh, dramatize a little bit about Catherine of Aragon. Uh, it'll be mainly narrated that bit. Um, we've got half an hour to show the Henry VIII rebellion ah. uh, against the Catholic Church, so we do have a whole program dedicated to that there's a lot in it there's thomas more there's um um, you know the interaction between war and woosley there's the interaction between more and henry then the execution of uh thomas more uh we show henry dancing with his wives in a sequence which we call the dance of death it's (laughs) the only way we can actually show all his wives in a in a 30 minute show and show everything else as well so we're we're showing a, this dance scene where he dances with one of his wives after the other and goes right the way through it. So right the way through all his wives and then show how they're off screen. We show them how the wife died or was imprisoned or or, you know, was executed. I mean, he executed two of his wives. Yeah. Two of those he kind of like put under house, house arrest. Um, one died in childbirth and the other one kind of outlived him. <laughs> <laughs> um and another film that you made is called uh, the message, uh, the message of Fatima. Yes, um, message of Fatima. <clears throat> and uh, this won an award, best TV series. Uh, how do you say that? Nik Pokalanow. Yeah, Nia Pokalanow. Um, it's it's Polish. I can't speak Polish, so unfortunately. You, well, but, you, um, you won two Polish awards. You won a Polish award yes. for the Crusades and another Crusades, one for Fatima. Yeah. Yes, we were very pleased. I mean, it's not just me. It's my the, the whole team, you know, at EWTN and our co-producers in the UK and also in Slovakia um, that um, that won this. Um, so it's it's a it's quite a big uh, production, really. I'm just um, part of the the mechanism, you know. So um, there's a whole lot of other people involved. But um, yes, we we did win it. And we are very pleased about that. Um, the message of Fatima and the Crusades. So they both did quite well. We also got an honourable mention in the Great Gabriel Awards. I don't quite know what they are, but they they entered it in at, at EWTN and um, got an honourable mention for that. So we're quite they were they were very pleased anyway. But um, now what is so I was pleased too. <laughs> and then finally, uh, the dome. What is the dome? The uh, the war. The dome of home. Okay. That's my church in um, on the Wirral. It's uh, run by the Institute of Christ's King. They have the Latin Mass there, and um, 
I was asked to direct a series of audio tours for them. The dome was actually closed before it was given to the Dome of um, Institute of Christ the King. And um, we're trying to revise, revise it. The Dome of Home is called that because when the merchant seamen were coming back from America during the Second World War, when they saw the dome on the horizon before entering Liverpool, um, when they saw the dome, they knew they were home and it was a big relief to them. So that's why the church has got the name of the Dome of Home. Interesting. You know, I've been to St. Wellburgers, which also the ICK has recently taken over. Yeah, that's the um, Fraternity of St. Peter at some... Uh, no, no, you're right. That's Preston, isn't it? You're no, 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 Preston. it's in Preston. It's an ICK. I've yeah, been yeah, there. That is, you're right. Yeah, so, it so is. My, so we had, a tour, King. we had a tour guide uh, who was... Uh, I, I guess he wasn't really a tour guide. He was one of the parishioners, but he knew a lot about the, the building. And uh, he told us a phenomenal story about uh, this, uh, this, this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful church built in 1836, or they started building it, the year that the final supremacy law was repealed. And they chose the site to build it on, and they chose to build a 308-foot-tall bell tower. Yes, it's it's really high, isn't it? <laughs> well, and they and then the guy that the gentleman that gave us our tour said, now the reason that they built this bell tower so ha tall, and that they built it on this particular uh, location, is so that all the Anglicans in London could see it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it was so tall that they could that they could That's actually a good see enough it. reason. Right. Yeah. What, what what is that there? What is that there? Um, <laughs> and, and now, finally, on your series of Reformation. Because there are an awful lot of people out there that think that they, uh, because they've read the uh, the convoluted, falsified history of the Reformation written by John Fox. Um, oh, yeah. Fox is the stem that this lie comes from. That yeah, it was right. the, oh, that, that all the people of England wanted uh, wanted to get rid of Catholicism. Abject falsity. That is a straight up lie. That there were more Protestants that were martyred under the Catholics in England, straight up lie. Fox That's nonsense, yeah. Fox manufactured these numbers. Because like, yeah. some people will say, well, you look at their set of events and you see it this way, and we, the rest of the world looks at it correctly and sees it this way. There's only one way to look at history, and that is to define yeah. what the truth is and what are the, what are the actual historical record and what do the facts say. And the facts are this, and this is why I republished Gerard Culkin's book, and I challenge anyone, read right. the book and refute a sentence in it. Go ahead, big boy. Read the book mm -hmm. and refute one sentence in it. Go ahead, try. Um, because uh, Father Culkin goes to the, to the extreme of going back into all the history that was available to him before the computer age. So he went to the library at Oxford and went to the library at Cambridge, the two biggest libraries on earth. And he found all the documentation necessary to basically call Fox uh, to prove for once and for all that this John Fox guy was the liar that he was. Uh, and he was the ultimate pro Protestant propagandist. Do you, is any of this covered in the maybe in the first episode of the Reformation? We, we will cover it in the um, English episodes okay. about, about John Fox. Yeah, we, we will definitely cover that and uh, we will refute it. Uh, the the Reformation in England, as it was in most of Europe, was a rebellion of the rich. It was a re rebellion of the rich because they wanted church lands, lands that faithful monks had built up uh, through monastic discipline, through celibacy, through poverty, through chastity. They built up these wealthy estates and all the people on those estates had health care. They had a hospital. They had places where orphans could go. They ran the markets, all these noble monks. And when that was taken away and given to rich people, the poor, the ordinary farmers were left with nothing. And a lot of the, a lot, that's where vagrancy started to happen in England then because the poor were deprived of the care. It was, it was almost like there was a social service provided by the, by the monks to, to help the poor, to help the people. When all the monasteries were disillusioned under Henry VIII, all the core help for the ordinary people of England was taken from them. So it was a rebellion of the rich because, and that's why Elizabeth couldn't go back and why Mary found it so difficult is because the nobles had been given all these church lands, all these, you know, like all these abbeys. You see, like Downton Abbey, for, right, for right. example, you know, mm. um, why they're called abbeys, because the nobility were given the abbeys 
uh, that used to belong to the church, used to belong to the monks. They were given them. And so it was a rebellion of the rich. The rich did very well. The the people who were loyal to the crown, who wanted to, um, you know, do it for their own benefit. And the same happened in Germany. Um, I mean, people like um, Philip of Hesse, he wanted uh, a bigamous marriage, so he supported Luther. And Luther said, OK, marry her quietly because his first wife, he wanted to keep his first, first wife and have another wife. So Luther allowed him to have a bigamous marriage. So he had two wives and he was having children with Catherine and children with Margaretha, his second wife, at the same time. So that was the Reformation for you. It was it was just nonsense. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad that this makes it into film. And I'm glad that the story finally gets told in a manner, in a media manner in which moderns can go like, oh, you made a movie. I don't have to read a book. Fantastic. Where do I sit? So, yeah. <laughs> Well, Stefano, that's yes. uh, that's about all the time we had today. Um, okay. But it ro- hey, roll right through it. Uh, I would love to have you back. Let's do it. Let, let's do this again. Okay, great. Thank you. Yes, we will do. We'll do it again. I'll be glad to come back. Thank you. You've been a great host. Thank you very much. Uh, well, you're very welcome. Now, let me know when, when next you're filming in England. And you need me to come in and and, and and bark a couple of commands out and don one of those costumes because I'm in. Yeah, I think you'd have made a good Henry the Eighth. <laughs> Imagine me playing Henry the Eighth. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute. I want to be Robert Shaw in A Man for All Seasons. All now, right. Okay. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I want to be who 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 played uh, who played St. Uh, St. Thomas More in A Man for All Seasons. Robert Shaw was Henry the Eighth. Uh, was it uh, um, was it Hat Richard Harris? Was it who, who was? No, no. I know. I know that. Um, uh, Schofield played it. Schofield, Schofield, Schofield yeah. yeah, yeah. It's but you know if you if you know anything about the career of the great Robert Shaw, I mean he played some iconic characters. He played Henry the Eighth. He yes, played he the, played Henry he, the Eighth, play, yeah. he, he played Quint in the Jaws movie. Yeah, and he gave every, he gave the world uh, the image of a Russian spy and a spy who loved me with that spiked white hair of his. Um, oh right. So yes. he's a very accomplished, classically trained actor, Robert Shaw, and of course he was a great Henry the Eighth, wasn't he? Mm, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Stefano, thank you for your time and uh, my thank best. You. My best to uh, to KV um, uh, for setting this up. And right. Uh, okay. Let's stay in touch. Let's talk again soon. I'll keep you on my email list and let you know when things are going to be broadcast. Okay. Fantastic, Stefano Mazzeo, uh-huh. Everybody, thank you, brother. God bless thank you. you.